Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. over here in San Francisco. I'm Patricia Dugan. I am the community lead of Cluster One. Thanks for joining us this morning. We know we have some people uh, from all over the world, so super excited you could join us. Um, this morning, our, our Coffee with Cluster One series is meant to be a series of educational uh, workshops around training and to provide you with cool and interesting things, uh, education and, and discussion around deep learning. Um, and also some information around how, uh, around the value of using Cluster One. So um, we have crafted this webinar specifically for data scientists, uh, developers, and aficionados of deep learning um, and all things that fall under that. So uh, you can get to know us on Twitter, which is Cluster One underscore. Um, you can reach me real time at Patricia underscore Dugan. Uh, also, you can find us on Slack and then reach us via email as we'll give the contact information during the session. Um, the framework of today's uh, webinar will be an introduction and then we'll move on to some features and highlights and then we're going to go into a demo. Um, we welcome questions of all types. Um, you can go ahead and submit those using the Q&A uh, module or the chat box also works as well. And um, we're happy to answer those during or after the session. And um, then now we're going to pass it over to Malu, who's going to take, take the show away. Thanks for coming. All right. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for attending. Uh, my name is Malu. I'm a co-founder and product strategist at Costa One. And so today I'll give a brief overview of uh, the problem we're trying to solve our platform, um, give you a brief demo of how it looks and how to use it, and then go into the details of uh, our workshop, which is today about running distributed TensorFlow and distributed deep learning in general. Um, so during the workshop, I'll first go through the basics of distributed TensorFlow uh, and some design uh, constraints and challenges, and then go into some code samples and overview of how to run it, some architectural concerns, and then debugging, uh, tips and tricks before giving a brief overview of what's next in distributed deep learning and what may be the frameworks of the future. So we created Cluster One uh, with the mission of scaling AI for AI teams and making AI development at scale easier and more efficient. So we realized that many uh, AI teams were um, wasting their time doing setup, DevOps, and optimization. Uh, whereas they could be more productive focusing on the model. And so that's the problem we're solving. We were uh, founded in 2016 um, and uh, we raised in December of uh, last year our seed round with the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Seattle. So now we have offices uh, around the world across um, the Silicon Valley, Seattle, Poland, Canada. And so what plus the one uh, is built for is number one, accelerates research. So we enable uh, deep learning scientists and engineers to take advantage of scalability and distributed training to speed up model development and speed up research. We also um, make sure that uh, engineers and scientists spend their time on modeling, not on setup, by providing an out of the box system that works without DevOps. And finally, we um, create a situation where our platform runs on any infrastructure. It's infragnostic. And so that enables teams to not have to ch choose permanently a cloud or an on-premise solution because our system can run on any cloud or on several clouds at the same time and always leaves you the option to switch whilst keeping the same environment and, and platform and workflows. So essentially, Cluster One is a platform that runs any app or framework or deep learning tool that you may need, gives you access to all the familiar interfaces that you want as a data scientist. So a command line interface that's built for scripting and automation, um, programmatic access, an API and um, graphical user interface where people are maybe less familiar with deep learning can go and uh, visualize stuff uh, that their team is building. And Cluster One takes care of all the 
OS level things. So um, all the tools and infra blocks and workflow blocks that you need to set up, uh, but that doesn't really create value for the for you as a deep learning scientist. So we um, build and maintain and manage those uh, Kubernetes cluster, firewalling, access control, uh, distributed storage, etc. And so that platform runs on top of any infrastructure. Um, so that can be any public cloud, small cloud providers, or on-premise, or both. And can use any storage and any code store. Um, we started working with uh, uh, customers in the life science industry um, before generalizing to any industry. And so we worked with uh, Roche's um, deep learning uh, team and helped them uh, put in place a large scale uh, infrastructure for distributed training on terabytes of genomics data. So now I'll briefly go to an overview of our platform um, and what it enables uh, before going into the actual workshop and um, explaining some tips and tricks about distributed TensorFlow. So our platform is accessible through a dashboard um, where you can see your code and your project. So here I have connected my GitHub account. So I have my, one of my MNIST repositories, a super basic example, connected. And from this interface, I can manage my code and start jobs. I have also uh, the option to create uh, and manage data sets that can come from various sources. So for example, a WSS3 is available, um, NFS mounts if you are on premise, or generally speaking, uh, different storage options that you can all manage from the same place. And so from this interface, it becomes very easy to create and track uh, your experiments. So if I wanna create a job, I can just hit create job, choose my project that I've connected from GitHub, and then uh, choose my branch, choose my commit, uh, name it, one more webinar example, uh, choose the module I'm gonna run. So in this case, I'm gonna run MNIST, uh, mount any data sets or load directly the data uh, from my scripts, which is what's happening here, and then pick the environment. And so we have a, a collection of, of environments from uh, Jupyter to um, uh, any TensorFlow PyTorch build or essentially any uh, Docker image that you want, but those are the ones that we maintain and speed up. So here I'm going to run TensorFlow 1.3. And then I can select the package manager I want to use. And I have some requirements specified in, in a text file and those will be installed automatically. Once I have done that, I can select my resources um, that will be um, created on the underlying infra that you have. So this public platform um, is running on AWS, for example. And so I can select if I'm gonna run it single node or distributed. So in this case, I'll try running it with uh, four machines, five machines, one being a, four being a worker and one being PSs. And that requires my code to be running distributed TensorFlow. And now we'll go into uh, the details of how to do that during the workshop. And then I can specify how long this job will run and hit start. And so what will happen now is uh, the job will be started um, and uh, it will start collecting resources on, um, on the cloud provider and copying the data and will launch. And once the job uh, launch, you can track uh, what's happening. You can track uh, the outputs that you have. So in that case, uh, those jobs didn't uh, run. So I have no outputs, but uh, you can see what's happening. Um, and then you can visualize them and add them in one click to a hosted tensor board. So for example, um, I was just running a couple of different experiments, tweaking the learning rate and the number of hidden layers at the same time. And I could visualize how fast they were running and what loss they were giving. So in this case, I have a few successful experiments and a few that are completely exploding and not converging. And so I can just go there and uh, filter what's, what's working, what's not working using the familiar TensorBoard interface. And so um, here what's very convenient is that you can add or remove jobs from 
uh, tensor board in one click. Um, now my, my job has started. Um, I can see status, so the code has been cloned um, and um, resources are being gathered. So four of my workers have started and the PS is still being created. And once that happens, it will start and automatically appear in tensor board. I can also uh, collaborate on this and share jobs with my teammates and um, keep track of all my experiments here in the dashboard and all the experiments on my team. So as I said, we also have uh, a CLI. So you can uh, start with, by installing uh, our command line interface and in our Python package, just running pip install cluster one. And then you can just log in um, with your username and password. So this is running on our SaaS platform that is publicly available that you can sign up to and now to check it out. And then once I do that, I can, uh, I can launch job from, from there. So for example, I can just create uh, a job that is gonna be called one example and that's gonna run MNIST. And by default, it's gonna run uh, on one uh, CPU machine, for example. And then once I've done that, I can just uh, start this job and it will just uh, start on the platform. So in this case, it's already started. Um, so uh, I won't uh, be able to start it. And so the advantage of the CLI is that you can also do some scripting. So for example, I have uh, a small script here uh, called a tune that will uh, create a few job with various you know, learning rates hidden layer and it will just iterate through those jobs, start them all, and then I can just visualize them very easily in the platform. So I can just um, uh, run uh, tune.sh, and I'll just um, iterate through all those jobs and start it. So all the jobs are now being uh, populated on the platform and started. And so they will all appear uh, in this uh, dashboard here, and I can uh, track what's happening. So now I'll go into uh, the actual uh, workshop. Um, this is gonna be an overview of distributed deep learning with a, a focus on TensorFlow. Um, and I'm gonna assume that you have already ran a, deep learning model or you know the general principles and you have some experience with uh, TensorFlow or another framework uh, and you can um, um, read that code and, um, and uh, learn how to distribute it. All right, so uh, first of all, why distributed deep learning? Um, there's a couple of reasons why you would want to um, distribute your jobs and take advantage of flexible infrastructure. Um, usually you want to train several models in parallel and so you can call that experiment parallelism which is what you naturally do. Um, run several experiments at the same time um, and look at their uh, outputs live so you can pick uh, the best model candidates um, and speed up your, your research by running lots of stuff and selecting what, what works well. You can also want to train bigger models that don't fit on one GPU, in which case you would use model parallelism, or you can want, you can want to um, train your existing models faster or on a very large data set, which is gonna take days, so you need a strategy to distribute that, and that's uh, done using data parallelism. So I'll go into a brief overview of each of those and then dive deep into data parallelism. So experiment parallelism is the basic, basic idea of running um, several versions of the same model or different models. So a good use case is hyperparameter tuning. Um, you have a, a large parameter space and you wanna cover it fast so you're gonna use your the few GPUs you have or the scalability of the cloud to run uh, several experiments concurrently. And here, um, 
the idea is very basic and what you need to do is be able to track uh, those jobs and to compare them. In model parallelism, your model is too big to fit onto one GPU. And so what you're gonna do is assign um, different layers to different GPUs, split the model that way, and so make it fit. And here uh, you won't necessarily get a big speed up because the, the shallower layers on the first GPU is gonna um, need to be executed before the, the deeper layers get, get executed during the forward prop. And during the backward prop, the deeper layers are gonna limit the shallower layers. And so this enables you to uh, handle maybe the most state-of-the-art models that need uh, that are very um, large and where the weights don't fit on one GPU, but it doesn't necessarily enable you to speed up training that much. And finally, um, data parallelism enables you to train your model uh, faster by uh, having your fleet of machine, uh, each machine hosting the same model, but each reading different batches of data. So your first GPU is gonna read a portion of the data your second GPU is gonna read another portion of the data, et cetera, et cetera. And they're all gonna process gradient updates um, in a parallel manner and send them back to the model. And so this gives uh, good results, uh, is relatively easy to do if you know how to set up your code. So I will focus on that for the rest of this webinar. So the main paradigm that you use when doing that is the PS worker model. So you are gonna split your machines into two groups. One is gonna be uh, the parameter servers that are gonna host the model weights and be responsible for keeping track of them and updating them. And the second group of machines is gonna be called the workers and they're gonna handle the uh, processing part which is reading the data, um, calculating the loss, and sending uh, back um, gradient updates to the parameter servers after the backdrop. And among those workers, one uh, is gonna be uh, a master or chief and is going to handle all the checkpointing, uh, keeping track of what steps have been executed where, um, and coordinating the workers and so that sounds like a lot of engineering is required to achieve that. But the good news is TensorFlow has been uh, built and designed to handle large scale training across heterogeneous machines. And so the API is, is um, quite practical to do that rapidly. And I'll go into the details on how to code that. But first, um, there is two ways to view this problem um, and to execute this PS worker model. Number one is uh, synchronous training. So in this case, you're gonna have your workers um, read batches of data, process gradient updates, and then there'll be an averaging step where all the workers are gonna average gradient updates before updating the model. And so that uh, requires all the workers to complete one round of um, gradient calculations before um, sending the updates to the model. There's another way to do it, which is asynchronous, in which case uh, each worker is gonna read batches of data independently and send updates as they are calculated. And so this um, doesn't require the workers to, to um, wait for each other. And there's some um, um, a little bit differences in how the code is set up, but it also gives uh, different performances. So what you could wonder here is if I am sending updates asynchronously, um, it's gonna, the updates may not be, uh, may be contradicting each other and I'm gonna slow down my training. Um, this is true in some cases, but uh, it actually works quite well. And there's some papers that have shown that this uh, weird situation of asynchronous training actually um, yields good results. So now I'll go into, um, the actual TensorFlow um, objects you're gonna use to do distributed training and go into a little bit of what you need to do to set up uh, this and run it. 
So the first step is to define your cluster from the code. And so what you will do is define a tf.train cluster spec uh, that is going to contain uh, the addresses of all the machines that are going to be uh, participating in this job. The second step is to set up a tf.train.server passing the cluster object. And here you're going to assign uh, what will be the role of the machine and what will be its, its task. Once you have done that, um, so once you've set up the, the cluster and the server connection, uh, you're gonna assign to each uh, device the different roles. So if it's a parameter server, it will be assigned weights and uh, the model. And if it's a worker, it will be assigned operations. So what's going to happen is the weights are going to be on the PSs and uh, uh, operations are going to be on the workers. Once that is done, you will tell your nodes to join the server and um, you're going to set up this uh, assignment of model and um, uh, weights to, uh, to the devices. And this is handled by another object called tf.train replica device setter that's just gonna automatically uh, assign the right operations to the devices. And so this is um, fairly um, well handled by TensorFlow so that there's not a lot of manual work. And finally, um, you are gonna replace your usual uh, ses dot run your usual session by a tf.train monitor training session. And this object is gonna take care of all uh, the coordination, um, you're going to pass it a master, uh, the idea of the master node and where to save logs and a few hooks. And it's going to take care of the coordinating the running the job, tracking the number of steps that are ran on each worker, saving checkpoints so that if one of the node fails, you can recover cleanly and you can eventually export your model and uh, sending and support summaries. And all of this and all the initialization is going to be taken care uh, of by this object. So now that you have your code ready, um, you can just run this uh, script on each of your machines. So on the workers, you run your trainer.py or main.py and pass it the addresses of the PSs, um, the address of the other workers, and their task. And on each machine, you're going to launch the scripts passing the correct flags. And so this gives um, good results in terms of speed. So this is a, a benchmark that we ran um, using the open SLR dataset and the transform model on class one. And so what you see is uh, this blue line is the number of steps per second ran by one um, CPU machine, and this is 16, uh, 32 CPU machines, and you get the 16x speed up. And that speed up uh, you get depends on some tweaks you do and uh, the property of the model. Um, one thing I have completely ignored until now is how you handle the data pipelining. So anybody that has done uh, some TensorFlow knows that uh, data pipeline is usually quite messy and a little hard to set up, especially if you want to optimize it. But from TensorFlow 1.5, uh, there's been this new dataset API that's been uh, recently improved and released during the TensorFlow Dev Summit. And so this is gonna make your job of setting up the data pipeline cleaner. Um, so essentially, a good way to do it is to have a parse function that's gonna take uh, a file path or um, NumPy array and return a tensor, and then um, a construct dataset function that is going to construct that tf.data.dataset object um, and very cleanly take care of the shuffling, uh, the parsing, and uh, the batching. And this uh, dataset API supports a kind of functional programming uh, way of uh, processing your data, and so you can have all your cleaning steps um, in the data set, uh, fairly um, compact syntax and optimized. 
and then in your main, you're going to constrict the data set and create an iterator that is going to take care of uh, sampling the data. And that batch object is going to be passed as an input to the model in the monitor training session. And the beauty of this that doesn't show from this code is that all the optimization that uh, you want, like prefetching uh, the data and running queues that used to be extremely manual is now taken care of within that data set object. And it can deliver um, uh, lots of speed up without a lot of work because it's built in. So um, this is a very useful um, data set API uh, to use. I also want to say a little note on debugging. Um, TensorFlow has a reputation of being hard to debug and having very deep stack traces that are hard to interpret. And if this is true on one machine, certainly it's also true on uh, many machines. So if you get, uh, if you're running on 32 machines, it means you may get large stack traces on each of those and you need to exploit them. So um, I'm gonna share a few tips and tricks that I learned doing distributed TensorFlow. Uh, and that may be obvious, but are good to have in mind when you start. So the first one is have a subset of your data ready. Uh, it sounds obvious if you've done data science for a while, but I've seen many people forgetting to do it and then transferring 100 gigs of data to their workers, start a job, it will fail because it hadn't been debugged. They would transfer 100 gigs again and iterate like that. And it would just slow down the process a lot. So just subsample a little bit of your data and speed up your training like that. Um, and then a few diagnosis tip, uh, tips. Um, first, start running on one node, and this should work um, before you start running on multiple nodes. And then when you start running on multiple nodes, um, if it doesn't work, try to have a kind of checklist of how to identify the root causes. Um, does the job always fail at the same time? Does it fail on the same data batch? Do you have one corrupted data point in your data set? Or does it fail at checkpointing? In which case, maybe you can't write outputs to storage and there's a problem there. Uh, or it fails because of the same worker uh, all the time, in which case maybe you have a problem in the config of this worker. And eventually, um, and one other tip I have is, oops, is um, your problem when running distributed deep learning is separating whether the bugs come from the code or from the cluster or from both. And so to tackle this problem, we are uh, releasing a small utility in our Python package called uh, Just Run Local Distributed that emulates a distributed environment locally by uh, running workers and pieces in uh, Python processes on your local machine. And so that enables you to kind of try to expect what's going to happen and know if it's a problem with how the code has been written before you put it in the cluster and run it at scale. A few uh, potential root causes that we've seen for um, problems in distributed training. Number one is networking. So all the pods need to uh, communicate so they need to see each other and if networking is not set up right that won't happen and the job will not start and will hang. Similarly uh, if the job expects to start on 32 pods then if only 30 start um, the job will not start so it's important to make sure that all the workers and PSs have started. Um, bad initialization is also a very frequent problem where if you change your model, but you try to load an old checkpoint, the job will crash. Uh, and that stack trace is kind of hard to, to catch. And of course, all of this is um, taken care of if you have uh, your infra set up properly, or if you are using uh, platforms such as ours that has um, automated and optimized those steps. Um, TensorFlow 1.4 has an issue with distributed training, so I recommend either using 1.3 or 1.5 and above. Uh, 1.8 was released a few days ago, so this is probably a good idea to check it out. And um, to solve performance questions, in particular, 
um, the question that comes up is what number of PSs and workers I need to use. Uh, running benchmarks is still uh, one of the best options because it's hard to predict a priori what's going to be the bottleneck. So now I just want to say a word about something that I've completely assumed until now, which is how do you run uh, those 32 machines? How do you start them? Um, at the same time and how do you orchestrate them so uh, just a word on uh, having the right infra to run those uh, distributed deep learning jobs so networking is uh, important and especially if you want to optimize your your networking because it's you bandwidth is usually going to be a bottleneck in the training um, deep learning cloud orchestration and the full tolerance part it's also uh, going to be a, ne a necessary step because if there's a small chance that one node will fail, well, the chance that at least one of the 64 nodes that you're running will change, will fail, increases. And so you need to have a mechanism for fault tolerance. And TensorFlow handles the, the checkpointing and, and graceful recovery, assuming that you have a way to monitor your machines and restart them if they fail. Managing environments and requirements is trivial at small scale, but can be a little painful at large scale, especially if you're trying to optimize uh, your TensorFlow builds and the packages you, you, you're using. And uh, finally, distributed storage um, is a requirement because you need to read data from um, somewhere and read and write output somewhere and the speed of uh, your storage might become limiting. So having the right distributed storage in place is um, uh, a requirement to do this. And so again, this is a very well taken care of by uh, deep learning platforms out there, uh, including cluster one that has just um, seen this problem many times, automated it and optimized it for most of the use cases. So this PS worker uh, framework works quite well. It does have some limitations. Um, it does require to change the code, even though the API uh, of TensorFlow is now um, handling it very well. And each, with each version, there's some improvements in distributed training and how user-friendly it is. Um, parameter servers are, uh, require some tuning and some benchmarking. And usually network becomes a bottleneck when the number of workers scales up, which requires you to be a little smart about it. And then um, you need to have the right infra setup and the right monitoring uh, to make this happen. So I can answer a few questions uh, before going to my final part, which is what's next in distributed deep learning um, and uh, conclude. So don't hesitate to use the, the chat or the Q&A to ask any questions. If none, I'll just take them uh, at the end and go, go forward with um, distributed deep learning in the next generation. So what we see is that um, we've heard two weeks ago at the uh, TensorFlow Dev Summit, um, that PS worker is from the CPU era. So what I just described is from the CPU era, from Igor Saprikin, one of the uh, TensorFlow developers. Um, and so what that means is not that this is irrelevant. This has been used by Google for, um, for a few years and uh, given very good results and speeds up and enable to train uh, models faster and models that would have, wouldn't have been realistically trainable. But what this means is that this is becoming one of the several options to do distributed deep learning and probably the easiest. And so it's interesting to look at what's gonna happen, and what's gonna be the framework of the future. And so there's essentially three design challenges or three points in the analysis uh, grid when you look at this. Um, so number one is performance. Are you getting a good speed up? And how does that speed up scale? Can you run faster on five machines and does it reach a plateau or can you scale it up to 60 machines? Switching costs are also a decision criteria. 
um, as a developer, um, I usually don't want to change my code every time I want to change the way I train my model. And so the amount of code changes is a big decision factor when picking a framework. So uh, distributed TensorFlow is quite easy to put in place. Um, but some uh, other frameworks are also addressing that problem and trying to make advances there. And uh, infrastructure and the technology required there is also um, design constraint. And so to, so Uber has had the, this, this analysis of saying, what about if I want to scale uh, a lot? And what about if I want to push adoption in my teams? I'm going to have to have a framework that is quite user friendly and, and doesn't require lots of code changes. So a few months ago, they released Harvard, which is essentially a distributed deep learning framework based on the principles of MPI. Um, and then uh, it enables better performance at use scales. So what you can see here is um, a benchmark of Horvath in terms of images read per second on uh, different scales. And so TensorFlow does well um, up to uh, quite large scale, but in massive scales, it, the performance is degraded because essentially of the network. So versus the theoretical performance you would expect, you don't get uh, more than 50%. And our vote has managed to get um, performance that approaches what is the, the target performance. Um, it also has um, an API that's quite user-friendly and um, requires uh, not that much code changes and kind of facilitates adoption. So that's something we're looking forward to integrating in our platform um, and that I think would be uh, a good way to do distributed deep learning uh, in the future. Uh, TensorFlow itself has introduced uh, a similar approach um, that was unveiled at TensorFlow Dev Summit two weeks ago. Um, it used to be available in the TF nightly build, but I think it has now been integrated into TensorFlow 1.8 that was released two days ago. So on that, um, thank you very much for attending. Um, I will 